Um, but Kenyon, it was interesting listening to Terry Stotts because he brought up Georgia's Hall of Fame chances. Yeah. You are talking about one of the top five winningest coaches in NBA history. It should make him a shoe in for the Basketball Hall of Fame. But I, I don't know, Kenyon, do you think that the way he's been trashing people around the game in this book. And by the way, he also said in the book that he brought up those old conspiracy theories about the NBA being yeah. raped. I mean, he mm. really took a torch mm. to a lot of stuff. My opinion, George is not deserved. George is not a good basketball coach, in my opinion. Really? He has wins. He's been blessed with talent over the years, but X's and O's and all. He knows that, but you have to be a complete basketball coach. Mm -hmm. You have to coach defense, special situations, getting to know your players, treating your players right. All that, in my opinion, mm -hmm. all that plays a factor in, in, in order to be considered a Hall of Fame player, Hall of Fame coach. You know, things tarnish people's legacies. Look at Pete Rose. Yeah. Pete Rose's mm -hmm. legacy has been tarnished forever. Mm -hmm. He can't do anything to get in the Hall of Fame. Right. I think things like this that come out with George shouldn't be denied. Yeah. Well, I mean, this obviously is not the same as gambling on the not game, all, but, but I will say, but the, you're right because tarnished all, him. Yeah. Tarnished Hall of Fame him, has no an instruction to their voters saying, yeah. They should exclude anyone who has, quote, damaged the integrity of the game. Definitely. So we'll have to see if oh, they well. feel like this counts. Well, we have to take a quick see. break here. Oh, well. I don't know if y'all yeah. heard about this, but George Carl has a book coming out. It's been in the news just a little bit lately. And from what we can tell, it's pretty much a front cover and a back cover with a match and a can of gasoline. <laughs> he takes shot after shot at all these different players that he's coached. And he's been just as inflammatory doing press for the book. Yesterday in New York Magazine, Carl said this, quote, I was watching the Portland Trailblazers play and I was trying to figure out what the hell is wrong with this team. My conclusion is that Damian Lillard is getting too much attention. I'm going to say Lillard is the problem. They were together, they were connected, committed as a team last year, and this year they're not. Okay, I I'd just like to note here, Damian was on both this year's and last year's Trailblazers team, so I'm not sure how that even makes sense. But I don't need to argue with George over this because Terry Stotts did it instead last night, and it was amazing. I owe a lot to George. Uh, I got my start in coaching with George. Um, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. He's a successful coach. That being said, uh, if he wants to uh, diminish his chances for the Hall of Fame, if he wants to undermine his chances to being a head coach again in this league, if he wants to settle old scores with GMs or players or whoever else, that's his prerogative. But when it comes to my team and my players, he needs to stay in his own lane. He doesn't know Damian Lillard. He doesn't know how coachable he is. He doesn't know what a great teammate he is. He doesn't know how much Damian cares about winning and how important he is to his franchise. And I thought his comments However well intended they may have been, which I don't understand, um, I can't tolerate. I, I mean, frankly, I, I feel much the same way Terry does. I don't understand what George is doing making all these comments. George is one of the winningest coaches in the history of the sport. We all really enjoyed working with him here at ESPN. He got a ton of support all around the NBA when he battled cancer twice. So why go burn all those bridges now? I like blunt talk as much as the next person, but there is a difference between telling it like it is and using coded language to reveal yourself as out of touch while you take cheap shots at people who trusted you. And make no mistake, that's what's happening here. In the excerpt from the book that got so much attention last week, Carl attacks Carmelo Anthony, Kenyon, J.R. Smith, calling them, quote, spoiled brats. He called Kenyon immature and insecure, and he wrote that, quote, Kenyon and Carmelo carried two big burdens, all that money and no father to show them how to act like a man. Now, this morning on ESPN Radio, George <coughs> sort of apologized for that last part. Take a listen. I said it poorly, and I'm sorry that I said it poorly. And I'm sorry for the reaction because, I, you know, I know Kenyon, you know, the one thing I love about Kenyon Martin, he is a good father. George also said on ESPN Radio that, quote, sometimes when you take excerpts out of the book, it becomes not exactly what I said. I don't really understand that because, well, it's your book <laughs> that you wrote. George also said he wants to get back into coaching. And to that, I have to say, I hope you like college <laughs> basketball. Personally, I, I can't ever see him getting an NBA job ever again. Kenyon, I do want to start with you. <laughs> you had a very angry series of tweets, and entertaining, by the way, Thank right you. after the excerpt were released. You called George a coward. You called him awful. Talked about a lot of former players not liking him. 
you've had a week, but even more stuff has come out. How are you feeling right now? What's your reaction? Still the same. Uh, I don't I have uh, my feelings for George Carl is that he is the person who he is and he's showing everybody who he is. The person who I dealt with playing for six and a half years in Denver. I saw it firsthand every day. Him coming in the locker room, not speaking to people, him talking down to other people, him treating people in the organization like crap. I'm saying, I saw it year in, year out. So now, now the world is getting to see it. That's all it is. How bad was it when it was bad? It was real bad. It got heated at times. Um, myself, other players. Um, but I take the full responsibility for my action and my problem that I had with George Carl. And it was basketball related and other stuff. But if it was just about basketball, it was fine. But then uh, with these latest statements and all that, he crossed the line. It became very personal. Yeah, definitely, definitely, because it has nothing to do with me, the way I acted towards George, had nothing to do with the way I grew up. Nothing at all. My mother did a great job raising me. You know, so <clears throat> him to take shots at her and to say, I act like this because I didn't have a father, has no, no merit whatsoever. One might <laughs> even say that you were able to rise from whatever yeah, you didn't have yeah, as a like, kid. Yeah, like, and it's an accomplishment <laughs> definitely, but that you were able eyes, to succeed the way you were. Yeah, but in his eyes, is it's not the case. You know, he looks at it as the, in a negative because he's a negative person. And that's who he is. And that's what this book is about. It's all negativity is coming out of this. Nothing good so far. Byron, you coached Kenyon. You heard what another coach had to say about him. How did that make you feel? And what did you think? You know, like you said, I, I know Kenyon extremely well, you know, from a personal standpoint, from a basketball standpoint, uh, one of the brightest players I've ever had. Uh, you know, his basketball IQ was off the chart. And, you know, we had a, a good laugh in the, in the green room just talking about the good old times and when we were in New Jersey together. And, you know, he talked about how hard I worked those guys. Uh, but we also talked about some of the things that went on in practice and game situations. The thing that I found about him as a rookie is that very intelligent, uh, very mature, and understood the game of basketball better than most rookies I've ever seen, mm. and had a will to win every single night. We, we already talked about it. He wasn't the greatest practice player in the world. <laughs> that was a pre-show <laughs> that, conversation. That wasn't, that wasn't something that he liked doing on an everyday, on an everyday level. But when the I lights came on, popcorn, like yeah, when the lights came on, we're not talking the about the guy practice wanted coach. to compete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he, but he did it. Yes. But he wanted to compete. Yeah. You know, so when I when I read and heard all this stuff, you know, it was kind of like, you know, you just shake your head because I know him from a personal standpoint over the years, 16 years I've known this young man, and I've seen him with his kids, and I've seen him on that basketball court, and I know how genuine he is about his family and about the game of basketball. Now, now he did say that he had a poor choice of words on the radio this morning. Does that count as an apology to Not you? Not at all, man. He's only saying something because of the reaction that he got. You know, if nobody would have said anything about the wording of the book or the excerpts that come out, then he would have been fine with it. He would have went on whenever the book comes out, sell his copies, get his residuals off of it, and everything would have been fine. So now he's trying to backtrack the statement saying he, he knows me. You don't know me. You never took the time to get to know me. You never asked me how I was doing, how my family's doing. You never asked to come meet me at dinner. So how do you know me? You only know what you think you know, you know, and that's not a lot. And I assume he has not called you not to apologize or anything like that. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, Byron, you're a little bit in this position because you are a coach who has seen mm -hmm. and done a lot of things, mm -hmm. and you are currently writing a book. Yeah. And you know the pressure that I assume publishers want to say, what, what do you got, what do you got, what do you got? Yeah. How, how does that, when watching what's going on with George Call right, right now, how is that influencing you as you're writing right now? Well, you know what, it's still that code as a player and as a coach when you're in this league. Uh, that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's the same thing in the NBA. You know, things that happen in your locker room, things that happen between you and a certain player, it stays there. And, you know, and I'll go to my grave with all the stuff that I've that I've had with being a player and being a coach, because that's just the way it's supposed to be. Now, in, in selling books, yeah, everybody wants to hear about the negativity, you know, the controversies, all those things sell books. And in the book that I have coming out, you might have one paragraph or something that I didn't like about a certain player. Mm -hmm. But that's it, because that's, that's not the whole function of my book. George's book is obviously dealing with players. And like you said, if I looked at it and said, I guess he don't want to coach in the NBA ever again, because you know, from some of the things that he said about players and general managers and things like that, and ownership and, and franchise, I, I don't see you getting another job or another opportunity. But if this is the way he feels, that's the way he feels. But in my world of the NBA, you don't burn those bridges and you leave those things in the locker room or you leave them on the plane or you leave them at home or you leave them wherever you have to leave them, but you don't bring them out. 
It's just hard, too, because, I mean, look, whether you want another job or not, the NBA has given everybody involved with it so much, right? That's right. And Absolutely. especially a guy who, when he was sick, I feel like a lot of yeah. people in this league rallied around and him. And then when ESPN presented him with the award, I was the only person from the whole organization that came to Los Angeles to support him. The only person in the whole organization. And no, then... And then, not this. <laughs> and then, like, who's to say, like, what conversations he's had behind closed doors that don't come out? About myself, right. Right? right? About Carmelo, right? And maybe after I left Denver, that's why I had a hard time getting a job after that, right? Right. You know, Lord knows who he had these conversations with, right? Well, I mean, look, he does say. I mean, you said, "Oh, gee, I read this and I wouldn't think he wanted to coach again." He said on ESPN Radio this morning, "Every day I wake up, I want to coach again," which is amazing. Which but he didn't say he, he, he didn't say NBA. Well, he just said every day I wake up, I want to coach again. <laughs> As I said, I don't think that's on the table anymore. <laughs> Holds it out against Bogdanovich. Jimmy starts to drive, step back in the air. Oh, let me oh. step back and oh, kiss my. myself. Big time play, big, wow. big time plays. Woo. Butler. Oh, my goodness. And they just left Bogdanovich out here on the island by himself. And he says, you know what? This is Jimmy G. Bucket Island. Get some. Step back. Kiss myself, Neil Funk. Sriracha! Sriracha! <laughs> Can you say what you just said? <laughs> hey, where's the two minute report on that carry, Jimmy? Listen, I like Jimmy, but he's a great player, but Jesus Christ, how about the lead up to the shot? <laughs> Can't nobody guard that? That's a hot in, in the day. Ain't nobody yeah. guard that. 2016, my friend, it's a different league. Jesus. <laughs> I love it. I love how he was under pressure. I love the guys mobbing him afterward. I love Dwayne Wade and how much props he gave him afterward. I feel like that team is functioning chemistry-wise so much better than people expected. So. Well, you know what, though? Thing. I mean, at that particular point, Jimmy only had 38 points, and you're going to leave him out there one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Come on, Brooklyn. go Somebody go double-team him. Don't let him beat you. He had 38 at the time. And they was watching somebody the go get like it. Up. And they was there watching the show just like that. They wanted to see if he was going to make it. The mother, eight, listen, other eight guys out there wanted to see if him. he was going to make it. Hey, yeah. guess what? Well, Look, he did. They had their curiosity <laughs> stated. All right, so let's turn our attention to last year's unanimous MVP, Steph Curry. Christmas Day did not go well for Steph. He didn't play well. Clearly frustrated with how he was used. And after shoot around yesterday, well, he was talking about it. Steph said, quote, I definitely want to be in more pick and roll situations, whether I'm getting shots or whether we're manufacturing ball movement. That's a strength of ours, regardless of how teams play us. So guys, then the Warriors played last night after that quote. It sounds like Steve Kerr was listening. Steph, indeed, the primary ball handler and a bunch of pick and rolls. He looked more solid overall, but the Warriors still pretty uneven. At times, they looked amazing, and then at times, they looked crazy sloppy. So, Byron, do you think Curry's comments are a big deal? Is he right about how the Warriors should be using him more? You know what? I don't think it's a big deal, to be honest with you. My only problem with it is I hope that Steph went to Steve first and said, Coach, you know what? I need to be in more pick and rolls. KD needs to be in more pick and rolls. Clay needs... You know, just put us in that type of, you know, environment where we can make plays for ourselves and our teammates. If, if that's what he did, I don't have a problem with it. I, even as a coach, you know, back in the day, I would go to them and tell them, you know, okay, Mark, tonight you didn't do this, you didn't do this. And then you go to the press and you say certain things, you know, so it's not a surprise to him. So if he said, the, said this to the media before he even talked to Coach Kerr, yeah. then I got a problem with it. But I think they have a pretty good relationship. I, I think they get along extremely well. Uh, but if he went to... Steve has talked to it, but then, of course, Steve is going to look at him and say, hey, two-time MVP, we're going to put you in more pick and roll. <laughs> yeah, it's only, here we go. <laughs> there's only one ball out there, man. I don't think it's a big deal, right? but there's only one ball out there. And when you add Kevin Durant to that equation, your percentage of times you hunt the ball is going to go down. Right. That's just the nature. Right. Steph Curry ranks 34th in the league in time, the time that possession that he's got the ball in his hands. You might think that that would... Up a little bit for just, just a little bit. even if you're sharing the ball a bunch of bunch of all-stars all right since we are talking Cavs warriors the nba released its two-minute report Kenan, for the christmas day matchup <laughs> some calls were missed in particular two key calls that should have been in golden state's favor lebron james hung on the rim should have been whistled for attack that ain't even hanging oh well that's swinging <laughs> <laughs> richard jefferson tripped kevin durant on the final play should have been called for a foul as kd said i didn't fall by myself 
Still though, KD is upset as he was on the day of the game. He doesn't like the two minute report. Take a listen. The refs didn't lose that game. If we lost that game, we could have been better. I think it's the, the NBA, the NBA throw the refs under the bus like that. Like this happened to be in our favor. I, not even in our favor. We don't get the win, but you know, to say that I, I got fouled and the tech and all that stuff, you know, just move on, man. You don't throw the refs under the bus like that. So because the next game, you know, that group of refs or whoever it is gonna come out and they're gonna ref the game. Um, they're gonna be tense when they ref in the game and they're gonna try to get every play right. They'll try to be perfect. And, you know, without just going out there and relaxing and making the right call. LeBron James also expressing his displeasure with the two-minute report, saying, I think it discredits what the referees are doing for the other 48 minutes. Kenyon, how do you feel about the two-minute report? I don't see the need for it, but if you're going to put a report out, why not do the whole game? That's you know, a lot of work. Not? Hey, why not? Hey, <laughs> they got people that are watching referees just watching them. Right. You know what I'm saying? So why not? What do you think, Byron? Well, you know what? I, I've always felt this about the league anyway. You know, you can go to any NBA game and you can go get your drinks and dinner and go to a movie and come back with four <laughs> minutes left in the game, and that's when the game is going to oh, start. come on. You're not one of those people. Hey, listen, the two-minute thing, the, the, the thing I will say about that is I disagree with, with KD in the sense of that the league is trying to make this league better, and they're trying to put a little bit more, more onus on the referees to get it right. You know, so... Just like players, you know, we hold you guys accountable when you don't do certain things. The referees are being held accountable for missing calls. So for putting them on blast, I don't have a problem with that. Well, they're showing fans that they're holding them accountable. Exactly. And frankly, as someone who has covered other leagues, like, I don't know, the NFL, yeah. I can tell you <laughs> that when the, league the pretend, well, when the league pretends that everything its officials do is right, mm -hmm. and people have eyes, and we all have replay, and yeah. we can see that it's not true, you lose confidence in the league and the officials. So at least you have someone from the league office saying, hey, we know that these human beings aren't perfect right. because they're not. Right. And we know that they got this wrong, and we are trying to get do this better. I, I think that's a good thing. I like that as a fan. Well, with all this modern day technology, it won't be that hard to get it done to watch. To get it quick and to do the forty eight minute report. Yeah, but, but the game ain't really on the line to the last. I understand that, minutes. but why? But why say anything? Go make, you, hey, but why, you know what? Like but you, you too, but why say anything? Then? I agree with you there, but. Their job is to be as perfect as they can be yeah, as right. a referee. Yeah. Right. And for in order for them to be that way, sometimes you got to put them on blast. There you go. There you go. All right, we got to take a break, but when we get back, we will ask Kenyon if his son can beat him in one on one already. And wait until you see the video. This is a valid question. First, though, here's our know. distant replay put a bet up on this one, Kenyon. <laughs> from this date in 1999, featuring our favorite distant replay guy, Vince Carter. <laughs> Just run the other way. Oh, no, you did not. <laughs> in, a not game. in a game. 360. In a game. 360. Yeah. In a game. One hand. Then put it back and up. Come on, man. Just love. We're going to have to have, like, Vince Carter months on the jump where we just have Vince Carter replays. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you right? got enough <laughs> to cover it.